Hello, this is Lee Adams again. I'm coming directly to you from the studios of BBS Gospel Net, which is located at 515 South Main Street in the city of West Memphis, Arkansas, uh, owned and operated uh, by Dr. Lou Smith and co-owner Dr. Victoria Smith. And I wanna thank uh, them for this opportunity to bring to you uh, the second portion of the Galilee uh, trial in my own way. Uh, and the first portion of which entitled Denial, Denial, Denial. And you can go on uh, YouTube and uh, pull up the Galilee uh, commentary that I made. I previously spoke about who I am uh, as a retired teacher, uh, public schools, as a pastor in both Tennessee as well as Arkansas, where I now pastor, have uh, participated in funeral services on both sides uh, of the Mississippi River, uh, as well as uh, places such as Cincinnati, Ohio, Starkville, Mississippi, and in and around the West Tennessee North Mississippi area. Uh, I'm also um, regional vice president of the Consolidated Missionary Baptist State Convention of Arkansas. I serve as a facilitator and instructor as well as a board member for the Jacksonville Theological Seminary and Revelation Message Bible College of Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I do hold other posts and assignments as well, and I believe that uh, my position uh, in ministry as a longtime pastor, uh, moderator, and other offices that I've held uh, certainly does qualify me to be able to speak on the issues surrounding Galilee Cemetery. I want to let you know I am not speaking uh, as a lawyer, but I am speaking as one who is very concerned about what was said and what was done as far as the outcome of the case. I want to let you know that many families are disappointed, over 1,200 families are disappointed in the jury's decision uh, as our counsel worked tirelessly, uh, worked hard, uh, put many uh, hours in, man hours, uh, that expanded over four and a half years. And in that time, the defendants continued to uh, deny any responsibility at all for any actions that took place uh, at Galilee Cemetery or between the funeral home and Galilee Cemetery. What I would like to do is give you a brief synopsis of what we do know uh, especially from uh, when the September 26th edition of the Memphis Commercial Appeal as it was written after the jury verdict. And we will add our commentary to that. And, in, and not only that, but we want to provide some uh, definitive answers, uh, uh, cross uh, answers, rebuttals, uh, to what has been spoken of by those who are put on the stand for the defense. As you know, uh, the J grand jury, Shelby County Court Jury, excuse me, uh, decided that uh, area funeral directors were not responsible uh, for the mishandling of bodies at Galilee Memorial Garden and that the cemetery was 99% responsible for what happened there. And I don't know how they came up with the, that formula of 99% and 1%. I don't understand it. I, I do know that uh, if a person goes into an operating room and has cancer um, and the doctor says, I've got good news for you, we remove 99% of that cancer. And the patient would say, but I still have 1% left. It wouldn't be a good number. 
And so we're saying that that 1% is not a good number to assign to uh, the funeral home in light of the fact that they were the two culprits uh, involved in it uh, and are trying to uh, implicate uh, the state of Tennessee as one of those who are responsible for what happened at Galilee. Uh, there was a class action lawsuit with more than 1,200 plaintiffs. Plaintiffs whose loved ones uh, were buried in caskets, one atop the other. Cemetery records were in such a state that it's likely family will never know who is buried where. But yet, the funeral homes and directors say it's not their responsibility. The focus was on area funeral directors who, after services at the cemetery, left caskets at a pavilion or communal area to be buried later. And we're going to say that uh, you're right. You did leave them at a pavilion or some committal area to be buried later, but we don't know where. And the cemetery owner is nowhere to be found, and uh, the funeral home director can't tell the family where their family members are. But we do know in one of our um, funeral services, a relative hour of ours uh, was left on the side of the cemetery road. And so what we're saying is that this is un incorrect. In fact, we know it's incorrect because our loved one, I don't know how many others, he was an exception to that rule. The plaintiffs acknowledged that the funeral director did not personally mishandle the remains, but rested on the argument that the funeral, had the funeral director stayed until the bodies were properly buried, Galilee would have never been able to get away with what they did. And so we're contending uh, in this. Uh, no and yes, that in the case of one of our loved ones, they did uh, improperly. Uh, they did mishandle his remains uh, because his remains did not make it to a committal area nor to a pavilion. And as such, they, they were told to just leave him on the side of the road and we'll take care of it later. And it would seem to me that because of that, that they would have more concern uh, for the family than to leave a loved one on the side of the road. As a matter of fact, if it's not my understanding, I believe that it was raining that day. And their uh, explanation was, is that because of the mud, because of the rain, we're not able to get there. And so we just leave him right where he is and we'll take care of it. Uh, from there. But it was not Mr. Lambert or any of the owners. It was somebody who was just a cemetery employee who, uh, as you know, uh, we don't know anything about their uh, responsibility later on and what they did. We don't, as a matter of fact, we don't even know what the funeral homes, uh, excuse me, the cemeteries in Clement weather policy is because everybody knows that the weather in Memphis and the Mid-South changes daily, it changes weekly, it changes monthly, and it changes seasonally. And so what may happen on one day may be the opposite on the next day. Uh, it could be a rainy day, it could be a snow day, and then when the uh, snow and ice melts, it leaves nothing, uh, you know, but a muddy field. And as a result, uh, they've already testified that cars were lined up uh, in the back, and certainly if cars were lined up in the back of our uh, service and funeral homes, then they were lined up some in front as well. And so 
uh, it became apparent uh, that in this process that the funeral home did not exercise due diligence in making sure that our family remains and other family remains were treated uh, with care and respect. And leaving a casket on the side of the road in the cemetery is not due diligence. Uh, this uh, article also pointed out uh, the fact that the funeral home directors argued that there's no line item for burials in their funeral contract. And know where there is no line item for burials. You and I know, even if we buy anything, uh, especially an automobile or something, and it may come with a basic package, that we too have the option to add on. And there are lines that are assigned uh, in a contract for any add-on items. And so if you are wanted a premium package, you add it on into that. And so there is a line item for that. No, there may not be a line item uh, that talked about uh, for burial in the contract. But the fact of the matter is, is families were not buying burials. Families paid for a grave, they paid for an opening, and they paid for a closing. And if the family did not get that, then that is not a uh, sound contract that has been carried out. We just feel there's a breach in that part of the contract. If you purchase an automobile, a new automobile, and you get these ask for these add-on items, and they are added into the cost of it, when you get your new automobile, you expect the salesman who is handling your sale to point out to you everything that you asked for in your contract that was an add-on. So if in your contract at the funeral home and you put in there a grave, an opening, and a closing, that is what the family expects to get. Nothing less, nothing more. Give us what we paid for. But if you bring the remains of our loved ones to the cemetery and they are dropped off at some pavilion area in which there is no uh, way that we can determine if that is their grave or not, since there are so many who are behind us. We can't say and they can't say as a matter of fact that that was our grave. And we believe that what happened was after each casket was taken off and laid to the side that multiple caskets were buried in one grave. And we do know that if it is in inclement weather of which funeral homes and families do have to go to the cemetery for, that if it's too muddy for the family, then certainly it's too muddy for that heavy equipment to dig a grave, to open it, and then when it's in inclement weather, like it is in Memphis where it's raining, where it has rained the day before, it's raining the day of and raining the day afterward, then we know that rain fills up holes quickly. And as a result, it would almost be impossible to use this type of 
equipment to close a grave. And so Mr. Uh, Taylor wants to say that he doesn't believe in it, that the funeral home uh, violated any standard of care for funeral directors by not staying to the last shovel of dirt was placed on the grave. And we're saying, again, we're not talking about a last shovel of dirt. We're just talking about one shovel of dirt. We're talking about being in the presence of funeral directors, being in the presence with other family members, seeing a grave, seeing a family member being put in a grave, seeing at least one shovel of dirt going into the ground. We're not asking you to allow us to stay if it's raining, if it's muddy. We understand the conditions. But don't leave the family member somewhere at a provision of a pavilion or committal area and bring in another family to do the same thing when the reality of the situation is is that there are not mass graves that had been dug. And you and I know that it's almost virtually impossible, even when we see construction sites in the public, that these men, when it's raining, when it's pouring down, when there's ice on the ground, do not operate the machinery. It is shut down until conditions are favorable for them to continue their work. The jury found that the funeral directors did breach their fiduciary responsibility to their clients. The jury said you had a responsibility. And when you have a responsibility to the clients and don't fulfill it, you are liable. We're saying that when we went, and as a pastor, as someone who has officiated at my family members' services, I'm cognizant, I'm aware of the situation. I understand that we had to wait because there were others in front of us. I understand the fact that there were others behind us and that due diligence should have been made for all of the families to make sure that there would be no doubt left about where the family members had been buried. They said cemeteries are registered with the state of Tennessee, which knowingly allowed Galilee to remain open and active after its state registration had expired. After its state registration had expired. Now, everywhere we see in the case, in the trial, everybody says Galilee is responsible. But when that current home director signs that certificate of death and it goes back to Nashville to the office of the appropriate uh, place that if it says Galilee on there that I'm sure 1,200 death certificates were not overlooked by the state to say, well, you know what? We know that they're supposed to be closed, but we've got 1,200 death certificates that says they are still operating. And if the funeral homes 
knew this. Why are they still burying? Why are they still bringing uh, loved ones remain to Galilee? I want to tell you this, that all of those cemetery, funeral home, excuse me, funeral home directors are not going to tell us that they did not know that the cemetery license had expired, if indeed that was the case. And it would seem to me uh, that the proper thing to do, and I don't know, I can't look at the records, but I'm sure that there was some posting on the state website that would say active cemeteries, expired cemetery license, and all they would have to do is just go over there and check to make sure. But Mr. Jackson, who says, our Christian funeral director says contract for burials were with the cemetery, not the funeral home. And they're saying that, hey, you know, the state should have closed the funeral home. And I say to those such as Mr. Jackson and those of you know that when it comes to license, that even if it's your driver's license, and you've got some major violations, the state doesn't just automatically just take your license. There is a process that has to go through in order for license to be revoked. If you have a DUI, first DUI, you, the, your license on revoke. When there are violations there are procedures in place, and a lot of it has to do with remediation. If you can fix your problem, you remain in business. It's not anybody's desire, I don't believe, to snatch anybody's license for, for whatever reason. If they go to a barber shop and they're regulated and they find violations, they cite them and say, correct these. Health departments go into certain as, uh, the establishments that have food. They find violations. They cite them for them, and they say, correct them. We also know that there are some times uh, when the state may just shut something down automatically if there is uh, something that has to do with a child care, daycare facility, and has been brought to light about uh, gross uh, misconduct, uh, the state generally goes in and shut, shuts that facility down. If there is something that's dealing dangerously with munitions and munition plants, uh, and they find violation that jeopardizes life, uh, the state uh, whatever licensing department will shut it down. When uh, you have health care violations of such a gross, uh, uh, to a gross degree, uh, that it warrants being shut down immediately, that's what the state will do. But we who are out in the public, we know that the state doesn't automatically come in and just start cutting and shaving and closing and gives a person or a company an opportunity to get it right because they don't want to destroy anybody's livelihood, but at the same time, they want to protect the public safety. And Mr. Laron Jackson, who was one of those who was testifying for the defense, what I would like for you all to do, if it's possible, if it's possible to go, go to a state website, in which I have not done, and Google in LaRon Jackson and Christian funeral directors, you will find out that Mr. Jackson's funeral home is not spotless. It is not squeaky clean. And he has had some violations 
His funeral home has had violations that have been cited by the department. And so where he's so quick to point out somebody else ought to have been shut down, but yet when he does the violating, he wants a chance to have his problems remediated. And I think that is unfair to the cemetery as well. Uh, my brothers and sisters, this just about brings this case. But as our attorneys so brilliantly argued and asked for a certain amount of money for each family, all the time that the funeral home director's Attorneys were arguing. They was in denial. But when the verdict came back and said they had breached their fiduciary responsibility, but in their closing arguments, after our attorney had asked for millions for the families, this is what he said. We agree it's a tragedy for these people what Galilee did, said closing defense attorney John Branson. But the failure was with Galilee and with the state. Isn't that something? He wants to blame the cemetery and the state, but yet they had as much responsibility to make sure that the families were taken care of all the way to the grave because families had purchased graves, but they had given the money through the policies. And when he went out there, he took the cemetery a check on their bank account, on their company account which made them as much responsible because if he's paying for something on our behalf, he ought to make sure that we're getting what we're paying for. And it wasn't his money. It was the money of the families that was been entrusted in his hands, and he ought to make sure that it happened. And then at the end of the service, we thank you, family, for trusting your family members unto us. And that trust was violated because the family did not get what they paid for. One grave, one opening, one closing. Not one grave, three casket, one opening, one closing. And so there was this argument by our attorney, that the families should be reasonably, adequately compensated, not for just that time, but for all times, because we'll not be able to go to the cemetery, we'll not be able to view, we will not be able to uh, put flowers on the grave, uh, we'll be able to only do one thing, that stand on the outside and look in and remember the last uh, memory that we have of our loved ones not being put in the grave, but being put aside, waiting for somebody else. And for that, the defense attorney said, we're really sorry, but you know what? We believe that $5,000 is good enough to compensate for what happened. A slap in the face, even though previously they have denied, and yet the jury says, yes, you are responsible. You have a responsibility. And so now they want to dictate as a losing side what the jury ought to get give to the families who are suffering and still suffering and will continue to suffer until the last family member is gone. And that 
my brothers and sisters, is the kind of heart that insurance companies and their attorneys have for people who say that it's a tragedy. And if it was really a tragedy and you violated your responsibility, then show how much you are going to compensate and not just throw uh, some chicken change at a family and at some of the most brilliant lawyers in this country and all over the world. It's a slap in the face. And the judge gave the jury a blank check so to speak, and say, you write it in there. Whatever you feel, no number, don't worry about the uh, ability of insurance companies to pay. That's not your responsibility. Award according to what the damage is. If you can think it and put it on paper, do that. And don't be influenced by the other 11 jurors because we're going to take the sum of all of the money and we're going to add it up and divide by 12 and that would be what your decision would be as far as monetary damages. So I thought that it was clear based upon what our attorney said, reasonable, no less than 2.5 million per family to five million. And then here comes the losing side saying, oh no, it's not worth that. It's only worth $5,000. And then the jury goes in and says, when they come out, we'll award each family or family member, and we're not sure on what they're saying, $7,500. And this is supposed to be a jury of our peers. I don't think so. I think these were aliens. These were people who had been invaded by body snatchers because they certainly did not have a heart. And I want to say to you on today, this is our case. This is our commentary. And this is our belief that we still have been wronged, not only by the funeral home, not only by the cemetery, but by the jury as well. This is Lee Adams. This is my commentary. This is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. God bless you, and God keep you is our prayer. Keep praying for us and the family that this, uh, and other families, that this will never happen again.